If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything that you need all in one place. Let me explain. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on any listening platform like Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many, many more. It's everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome to the Wartime Leadership Podcast, where we explore what spiritual resiliency looks like from different perspectives. We often focus on the physical, emotional, and social areas of resiliency, but too often neglect the spiritual pillar. This looks different for everyone. We will be exploring what spiritual resiliency looks like in the lives of our guests, who are people from all different walks of life. Today's episode is sponsored by Success Draft, where we help you transform your dreams into drafted plans. Head over to successdraft.com to get started on your future today. This episode's guest is someone that I was introduced to by our first guest that we had, Chief Baden. He is a mentor. He is great. He is a command chief. So, I mean, he has all this responsibility. And so when he throws somebody your way, you know you're going to be impacted by him. So today we actually have Chuck Ball. Chuck, how are you doing today? Hey, doing doing good, Nate. Uh, Man, appreciate the invitation, Uh, dude. uh, I I don't know uh, what Chief Vaden seeing to me, but uh, he he must see something weird. Um, I have a story that that can impact others. So I'm looking forward to uh, sharing uh, this platform with you. And again, dude, thanks for the opportunity uh, to come on. Hey, absolutely. Hey, why don't you kind of give us a little bit of background about you? I know you're active duty Air Force, so and and I know you've got a heck of a story leading up. So why don't you just kind of walk us through your background? Hey, so uh, Chuck Ball, um, I'm originally from Gulfport, uh, Mississippi. Uh, I joined the military uh, directly out of high school. Uh, and it was one of those things where I, I decided to go military uh, just because I, I, I needed to see something different. Um, I came from humble beginnings where uh, poverty uh, was was a big thing in my life. Um, and I, I saw that I needed to do something different uh, where I can change the trajectory of my family and stuff. So I joined the Air Force uh, back in 2002. Uh, came in as a defender, uh, spent seven and a half years as a defender, uh, retrained over into uh, 4AO community, medical admin, uh, where I've been uh, doing this for the past 13 years. Um, absolutely love what I do. Um, I love the opportunity uh, to to give back uh, to our airmen and, uh, and, and serve our country. So how has that been different going from what we in the military community refer to as a flight liner to becoming a, quote, noner or back office support type person? Oh, man, let me tell you, it was it was a pretty tough uh, um, uh, transition. Uh, right. I come from a career field where. It was a matter of life or death. Uh, I came in during the height of the war uh, where uh, you had to do what you was told or you can you can lose your life. uh, Right. So as I transitioned into the medical community, I adapted that same leadership style where uh, I'm going to be directive. Right. So we can get to what we need to uh, um, uh, get after. Right. But that didn't work so well in the medical community. Um, I was uh, open uh, to a rude awakening uh, where you know, I had several days where people just come into my office and they're crying because of my approach, uh, right? I didn't understand uh, that, hey, you're no longer up in the field. You're no longer in a battle space where uh, it's a matter of life or death. You can actually uh, take take the time, uh, 
listen to you people, uh, right? Uh, where you didn't have to be as directive as as you need to be up in security forces because it wasn't a, a matter of life or death what we were doing uh, within the 4AL community. And and as we we actually learned, there's always a time to be direct. There's always that time where directness is can be positive, right? You you there there are those moments when you need to be that when you need somebody to jump, so you you do it in a certain way to to make them do it at that moment. Absolutely, man. Um, and I tell you. Um, I was very, very fortunate uh, because my med group superintendent kind of uh, had the same career path as me. He started off as a defender, uh, right? Ended up retraining, uh, becoming a 4AO as well. And it was one of those things where he's already walked that path. And because he walked that path, he knew uh, what, what barriers um, I would have in my face. And he sat me down and he was like, Chuck, hey, that leadership style just doesn't work over here. Uh, right. You don't have to beat the airmen down to get them to do what you need to do. Just have a conversation with them. Uh, right. Uh, where uh, what it taught me, uh, Nate, honestly speaking, uh, was it, it, it taught me to empathy, to have empathy. Mm. Uh, right. Be more compassionate as a as a leader versus just trying to uh, get after mission and, and, and push people. Uh, to, to the brink of being broken, um, essentially. So, uh, man, that transition, uh, like I said, it was pretty rough. And I'm thankful for the mentor that I had, Chief Master Sergeant Richard Bullock, uh, mm -hmm. to kind of help with that transition. Man, that's great that you had that in your life. But hey, we are already off to a fresh start. You know what? Let's let's start off with some some get to know you questions here, real quick. What is one thing that you find repulsive? Man, uh, so it's people uh, that's out for themselves. Uh, one of the things that, that, that I'm big on is servant leadership, right? Serving those that you're entrusted to lead in. Uh, you know, being in the military, uh, right, uh, you, you have those folks that are just chasing after stripes, right? Getting after the next rank. And they do whatever's necessary in order to do that. And you can kind of see through those people. Uh, so those those type of people, man, it's just, it, it's like we lose track of why we're here to serve. And it's to serve the people uh, that, that we're entrusted to lead. And those those folks that we're uh, um, our customers, right? Those folks that we, we need to give back to uh, and stuff. So, uh, those type of people are the ones that, that oh, it's very repulsive, uh, right? And it kind of irks at me a little bit uh, to have people like that because we're here to serve people, man. You know, and I think that even the people who are civilian and have never been military kind of listen to us talk about these types of things and they go, wow, I really connect to that. It, it doesn't matter what the job is. The people who are looking out for themselves are going to show their true colors no matter where you are. A a absolutely, brother. And it's it's one of those things. Everybody can see it and no one wants to be around a person like that. Yep. Uh, right. Um, um, my belief is, you know, uh, iron sharpens iron. Right. We iron need sharpens iron as people. one man sharpens another. Absolutely, man. And if you continue, uh, you know, to, to get what you can out of a situation, uh, right, your your sword is going to definitely uh, dole out. Uh, right where you're not going to be uh, as effective as you need to be as a leader and uh, not and as a person right mm -hmm. uh, we have to remember we're people first right yeah, absolutely we, we need to be the type of people that folks want to be around um and because if we lose connection with people right how are we going to grow there's no growth in not surrounding yourself with people so uh i i i i that's dude, I'll go down a rabbit trail. You let me keep on talking about this, man. Oh, hey, you uh, know what, though? I have found as a husband that, you know, since when I wasn't married, you know, I got married later on. I was 28 whenever we got married. I, I, I didn't I didn't see the value in how people saw their spouses and stuff because I wasn't married. I didn't I didn't connect in that way. But once I got married, then I was like, wait, I see myself as a husband first, you know, Christian first and then a husband. Absolutely. And then we didn't have a child until we adopted. So once I became a father two years ago, now I started to see why people were so passionate about getting off work or, or going places to go be with their families and stuff. Because now I'm a Christian, I'm a husband, and I'm a father. Then I'm in the military, right? Absolutely. So I see that passion a whole lot. Hey, man. So what is one thing that is in your online shopping cart that you have not bought? 
Uh, so I don't have anything in my shopping cart, right? But I do have this one thing uh, that I want to <laughs> purchase. Uh, it's the, what's that? It's the meta, uh, the virtual reality uh, oh, yeah. uh, piece, all uh, right? Um, I, I want that thing bad. <laughs> right, but I look at the cost of it being two ninety nine, two hundred ninety nine dollars. That's a lot of money, dude. <laughs> that's a lot of stock that I can buy up in a company uh, where I can get a return on my investment. Uh, so that's one of the things that I'm eyeing right now. Uh, hopefully, you know, around the holidays, I'm gonna go ahead and put this out there. Right, accent it shall be given. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, my 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 parents or a friend or somebody hear this and they can get gifted to me uh, here in the in the, in the future. Uh, and stuff because I, I I really want that thing, but I just can't see myself spending that two hundred ninety nine dollars for it. Hey, you get me that email address, and I'll make sure this makes it into your parents' email, <laughs> and then they can hear what that gift is out there. So I've actually uh, episode number three, DJ Kev White, a uh, good friend of mine up in New York City, international DJ. He actually just started a club in the metaverse. Yeah, yeah. For, for hip hop music. So it's it's a full club where people put on the, the glass and gear and stuff and then they're in the club. And I'm like, that's crazy, bro. I know. Right. Like, it's absolutely. <laughs> but it's amazing thinking about it. And then he's like, dude, you should come join. I was like, if you send me some of those glasses, I'll be there. A absolutely, man. It's, <laughs> it's a lot of money, but it's, it's pretty neat, man. I had the opportunity of uh, visiting a family member of mine to, to actually experience it. Right. And I was like, man, this is pretty cool. How realistic it, it is as well. Uh, and when he told me the price, I was like, mm, I don't know about that one. <laughs> as I get further and further away. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> what is one thing that you love about your job? Man, uh, I get to, I get to serve people, man. Uh, so, uh, I'm a 4 a uh, right, medical admin, and we have the opportunity to work in different areas within uh, the hospital from an administrative function standpoint. Uh, but I have the distinct opportunity right now uh, to, to lead uh, TRICARE operations and patient administration flight uh, where, you know, that deal with insurance, right? And mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. from a TRICARE standpoint, that it's a beast, oh, yeah. right? There are so many rules that come with TRICARE. Uh, but I have the opportunity to serve those folks that come in there that have questions about uh, their track here where I can just put it all on the table for them because uh, it's easy. Like, hey, all you got to do is go look at this guidance here. All uh, right. Uh, but it's so much. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I can just break things down and, and provide it to them up in smaller bite, bite sized pieces where they can digest it and understand the things that they're um, um, eligible for from a tricare standpoint, mm -hmm. I love that. And I absolutely love my, my, my airmen, right? I get to serve airmen. Mm. I get to give back and give them the things that I didn't have um, as early in my career. All right. I talked about my mentor, uh, Richard Bullock, right? Mm -hmm. That was 10 years in. I didn't have a mentor before then. So all of the things that I missed uh, in those first 10 years, I have the opportunity to teach my airmen at a young age uh, where they can kind of grow and understand uh, what it is to be an airman. I didn't learn how to be an airman until 10 years in, man. Huh. I was getting my job. Yep. Right. Came in, did my job. But in, in terms of like airmanship and what it is to be an airman, I didn't know that. Uh, and I have the opportunity to do that for my airmen. I think a lot of people forget the idea of what it is. You know, a job is a job. A profession, though, once you actually transition that mindset into this is my profession, that's when a lot of things start to change. Some people call it rebluing or becoming blue, but that's just becoming a professional. Now, now I have a profession, not a job. A a absolutely, man. And I can tell you, um, I didn't start to thrive until I understood that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it was one of those things that I was just going through the motion, right? I was good at my job, like I like I stated, but um, I, I wasn't a good airman. Yeah, and it's not to say that I'm a, I was a bad airman. I got in a lot of trouble and stuff like that, uh, but uh, I uh, I didn't understand what it was to be an airman until uh, that ten year mark in my career when I got uh, I latched onto a mentor. All right, so now that's everything that's good about your job. What is one thing that you would leave? your job for? I know it's a little difficult being in the military because we're told to go and do, but if you could leave it, drop it right now, what would be the one thing you would do that for? Honestly speaking, when when I'm done with the military, 
I don't want to work for anyone another day. Right. right that's fair. Um, I want to set myself up uh, in, in, in a position where um, I can spend more time and pour into my family. Um, serving is a sacrifice, uh, right? Um, and I, I want to spend uh, that time with my family uh, where uh, I can give back to them uh, because uh, we always talk about the military member and how they sacrifice to serve, but we never talk about the family. Uh, my wife and children have followed me all around the world, literally, right? And I want to take the time and I want to give back to my family when I retire. And if I need to go back to work, I will. Uh, but I've been investing um, along the way where um, I can be very comfortable uh, uh, being retired and just pouring into my family. And I know that is a very true fact with you, because as we were trying to figure out a time that we could actually meet between Alaska time and East Coast time where I'm at, it was all about the family. Let me pick a day when 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 I can do what mama needs at home and still be able to have a conversation with you. So I know that's a true fact for you. Yeah, a- absolutely, man. Uh, Cause you know, I haven't always been good at that. Mm-hmm. Just haven't, uh, man. And as we, we talk a little bit further uh, uh, a- into this conversation, I'm gonna kind of share uh, uh, some things that, that kind of impacted me uh, with not balancing my time uh, between uh, mission and family, so. Mm. All right, hey, so who is your favorite superhero? Man, if I had to go uh, superhero, um, Superman, uh, right? Uh, honestly speaking, dude, I was one of those people growing up. My favorite cartoon was Captain Planet. <laughs> right? With our powers combined. <laughs> yes. yes I got that, you. Dude, that was, that was like what I love watching growing up, man. And it's it's crazy uh, uh, to even mention that. Uh, right. Because most people look at your Superman, Batman, uh, you have your Wonder Woman and stuff like that. Captain Planet was one of those things that I uh, enjoyed growing, uh, watching growing up and stuff. So, See, that's that awesome. Be- that's awesome. I'm weird, right. dude. I'm different. I'm so freaking <laughs> different, man. I like it. Why not? You know, love the planet. Come on, man. Don't don't be shy about that. Not yeah, yeah. no, not not at all, man. Uh, I uh, dare to be different, right? Um, and I tell people, man, I'm weird. I'm super, super weird, <laughs> and I think a lot differently than most. Hey, and that's what we need. That is what we need. All right, so we've already kind of gotten into this a little bit, but why don't you walk us through your leadership style? Like, how how have you developed it? In between, you you said that you know the, the differences between the cop world and the administrative world was completely different. How have you developed your leadership style over the over these years? Hey, so where I'm currently at from a leadership style, I'm more collaborative than anything, right? You have to be collaborative uh, in leading because you want people to buy into the things that you, you, you need them to do. And if you allow them to be a part of the process, uh, where they can come up with solutions to the the issues that we're trying to get after, it makes it makes selling that thing that much easier, right? And then mm-hmm. when you look at it, um, it is something that we came up with as a team versus me being direct of, hey, do it this way, uh, right? If um, we use that collaborative method, now the people on the team know the why behind it versus you being directive and have to explain that why. Make them a part of the process now. Mm-hmm. And, and I totally get it where there's some time where you have to be directive and get after something uh, and, and, and things where we just need to get something done because, you know, something come down at the ninth hour. Yeah. Uh, but that's not a lot of things that we're doing in a medical community where we have to do that, where I can um, explore that collaborative leadership style where now I make you a part of the process. And I, I'm teaching you at a young age how to make decisions, critical thinking uh, and stuff. Um, I know what the guidance state, right? I'm teaching you the guidance. Now I need you to think through these solutions because when you be, uh, become in, 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 and sit in my seat, I need you to be able to do the same thing for the airman that you're leading. Uh, so that's the type of style that I use uh, in terms of leadership. It's more of a collaborative uh, form uh, than, than anything. And it, it's crazy, man. I uh, It's just yesterday. I had my tech sergeant come to my office, right? 
And she started to, to let me know what she was getting ready to do. I was like, why are you telling me? I don't care. <laughs> Go do it. And her statement after that was, you give me a lot of freedom. I was like, yeah. I, you, you are an NCO. I have to allow you to lead and make decisions, right? Only thing that I ask you is to keep me informed. Yep. And after you keep me informed, press on stuff. And it's one of those things as, as leaders, we need to allow our people to lead. We need to allow them to learn, mm -hmm. right? Not fail, learn, make the call. Um, we're going to have to make some adjustments along the way, uh, but it's okay to make some mistakes, uh, right? Uh, we, we learn from those and we don't do it again. Uh, so uh, I'm more collaborative, uh, right? And if, if we need to get something done, uh, we, we do it. And, and then I allow my people to lead, make the call. I think people are afraid to, to, to fail, right? Like some people are just absolutely afraid. They can't do it. But I tell my team, if you're skinning your knees, that's, that's learning. Right. Like if, if you if you fall just enough to, to skin your knees, that's learning. Now, if you fall and you bust your face, that's failure. And that that is not acceptable. Right. right. But I need you to learn through those failures. Absolutely, man. Uh, and it's one of those things we don't fail. We learn. Yeah, absolutely. We learn hey, what to do. So. What comes to mind when I use the phrase spiritual resilience? Spiritual resilience for me is connecting uh, with a higher power, right? My beliefs, uh, I'm a Christian, and I believe that uh, Jesus is Lord and Savior um, of my life. And when I think about spiritual resiliency, uh, it's locking into my faith, uh, right? And um, that's what I, I, I see in spiritual uh, resiliency and me locking into a higher power. Okay, so how do you build that with yourself? Uh, it's one of those things, man. Uh, I, I'm at church faithfully, right? I practice my faith um, um, uh, faithfully, uh, right? Um, it's one of those things where um, I have to get plugged in uh, with other believers that, 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 that uh, believe the things that I do, uh, where I can grow, uh, right? Uh, because, man, uh, there's a lot... Uh, from a Christianity standpoint that I just don't know, right? And I need to be next to other believers that think mm -hmm. just like me, where I can learn and live the life as Jesus uh, 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 commands us to, right? Um, so when, when I look at, at spiritual um, resiliency, it's being connected to uh, my Lord and Savior. Okay, so it, it almost sounds in the, in the same way as in leadership when being a humble leader is usually better than somebody that knows it all. So even in your faith, not knowing it all, but still being able to connect with other individuals. So you grow together. That seems like a, an important part of that. Uh, absolutely, man. Um, like, like I'm one of those people that I have mentors for different walks, right? I have professional mentors uh, from a duty standpoint, a work standpoint, people that I can kind of latch on to and then learn. And then I have my spiritual mentors as well. Uh, right. You need those people that's going to help uh, you grow. And those folks that hold you accountable when you get out of line, mm. those are the people that's going to tell you like, hey, Chuck, you need to get your stuff together. Right. You're not doing the thing. So, uh, yeah, you definitely got to connect with those 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 spiritual leaders uh, and mentors where it can kind of help you grow and whatever it is that you believe. Right. Because we're we we as a people, we all believe in different things. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So whatever that spiritual resiliency means to you, make sure you connect in those things. Uh, right. And just just for me, it's it's uh, uh, as a as a Christian. Um, I, I kind of tap into my, my spiritual uh, leaders and mentors uh, within the church. So now how do you build it within your family? How do you build spiritual resiliency within your, your spouse, your kids, that family unit? Yeah, we, we all, we all uh, go through this, this walk together, man. And I, my, I can tell you, uh, prior to my wife and I getting married, uh, right, we, we, we had our first daughter, um, Ariana, uh, right? 
Um, it's one of those things that I don't try to push my beliefs on my family. I allow them to grow in their faith. And uh, prior to uh, my wife not getting uh, uh, us getting married, um, my wife grew up Catholic, right? Um, in which she got my uh, oldest daughter, Christian and Catholic uh, and stuff. And I not denominational. I grew up Southern Baptist right now. Um, I'm not denominational and stuff. I still allow my my wife and my children to practice that that Christy, uh that that uh, being Catholic, right? I d- I don't try to shift them. Um, uh, as long as we're uh, reading and, and 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 living out the Bible, right? I mm-hmm. I don't care. We go to uh, we go to the same church together, uh, right? Um, I looked at my daughter, uh, and she she contacted me. She's a freshman, and no, she's a sophomore in college. Man, I'm trying to put her back a year, and she <laughs> was like, "Hey, Dad, uh, I'm, I'm um, for Lent this year. I need to give up something, uh, right?" And I, she was like, "What should I give up?" I was like, "Babe, it needs to be a sacrifice." Don't let me tell you what to give up for Lent. You need to give up something where um, you're going to sacrifice something uh, where you can get back. Absolutely. Right. And it's one of those things uh, that um, we're all Christians. Right. But I let them practice their faith um, as they see fit. Even my wife, we've been married uh, due for 19 years. Uh, she still believes in her her Catholic faith. Our Catholic background and stuff, even though we uh, we we worship at a non a denominational church. Man, that is absolutely beautiful, and that is a great way to look at it. I I have never had somebody on the show yet that that grew up separately in the same household. So that's that's a very unique perspective. So how do you build spiritual resiliency within your team at work? You said, you know, we all come from different faith backgrounds, or we all come from different backgrounds and stuff. How do you build? spiritual resiliency within your team? Hey, so uh, my belief is uh, be good humans, right? Um, In my office, right, I have Christians, I have Muslims, I have atheists. We just practice being good humans, right? And as long as we're all good humans, um, I don't care what faith you practice, right? Let's... uh, all have conversations and we have conversations about this uh in the workplace because it's okay wow, yeah because it's one of those things where we need to understand each other um it's not for me to push my beliefs out on, on to you we allow people to be open and they express the things that they believe in whether mm-hmm. they believe in 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 in, in, in jesus or they are not believe like the atheists in my office, but what I can tell you out of all of the people uh, uh, that that I serve with uh, today, they're all good humans. Mm. And that's the only thing that I can ask for. That is absolutely awesome. I mean, just, I, I think that more and more leaders are becoming open to those conversations. We're, we're moving for the longest time. I think that we were actually in this, this place where we didn't have those conversations, which is why we got, in the rut that we did for a long time within our career fields or even even in the civilian sector i think that that we don't have those conversations enough where if we have the good human conversation where hey listen i just need you to be good to one another i don't need you to be perfect i don't need you to think that you're perfect i need you to just be good humans that's an awesome way to look at it because with me one reason that i shied away from my Christian faith for a long time was because people were condemning me for the stuff I was doing, even though, you know, I knew it was a sin. I knew it was bad. They were, they were persecuting me for that factor. And so that actually pushed me further and further away until I found out we're supposed to be the hands and feet of Christ. And that means Mm -hmm. that we, we have those conversations. We sit down and, and talk openly about stuff and not necessarily persecuting that person across from us. So that's where I've kind of taken my vow to my team is I'm going to treat you, you know, and I'm actually going to have to change it now. I'm going to have to change it now. It's going to be, I'm going to treat you as a good human. Absolutely. But but, because it's our foundation of teaching, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Love. I am going to love you as Jesus loved us. He died for us on the cross to give us the opportunity to have everlasting life. 
right? Mm-hmm. And in in doing that, um, I'm going to treat you as if Jesus uh, would treat you. And when I when I talk about servant leadership, I think about Passover, right? And mm-hmm. how Jesus cleaned the feet of his disciples, even the one that betrayed him and Judas, right? You have to love your neighbor. Even if they uh even if you they 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 come against you, right? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna still love you as in Jesus will love you. Um, right. And uh it, it's crazy that that I don't know how I got on this conversation, but I'm 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 gonna uh uh, uh kind of uh nail it nail it home real quick. Um we have people um that um always come against us and we try to avoid those people at all costs and not deal with them we're missing an opportunity to step up in those people's life to kind of change the trajectory uh because we need to understand their perspective uh in in things and understanding their perspective you could shift that relationship that you guys are having uh, with one another. Um, um, so, uh, dude, that's that's one of the things that that I think we as humans have to do. We we shouldn't avoid each other, uh, right? And we need to love those folks uh, that we come in contact with, uh, like Jesus did uh, mm-hmm. when he cleaned uh, Judas' feet, but knowing I, that he was about to betray him. I love that it comes down to the point of just be a good human. If if you be a good human, you have the conversation. You just yeah. you just talk because guess what? People are having bad days. They're having and, and they're going through stuff that they just need to. And, and this is where I have changed the script with my with my staff. Whenever I came in with my instructor staff, they, they had a really good relationship with the last commandant. Everything was good in that office. Every everyone, you know, they knew, but they didn't know me. They knew me as a prior MTI. They knew me as that that drill instructor guy. But I came in and I go, listen, if you need to come talk, just let me know. Let me know if you need to talk to be heard or if you want to talk to me for me to respond. Do you want me to hear you or do you want me to respond to you? Because it's, it's two different things, right? And I think mm-hmm. that that's a part of that being human is just allowing them to be in that moment and to release whatever they got on them. A- a- absolutely, man. Um, you definitely have to be be open enough, uh, even if they're about to tell you something you do not want to hear. Mm-hmm. Right. You you still hear it. Feedback is important. Um, right. So uh, getting that feedback and listening uh, versus listening to respond, listen to understand uh, is, is, is key um, with with especially uh coming in as a as a as a new staff right uh you're mm-hmm. you're new to the team right they're looking at you as an outsider and they uh already assuming the worst based off of the community that you just uh came out of right um and just listening to what the needs of the team um right uh observing um and 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 then infuse yourself uh into the in, into the team and, and help the team grow from where they're at now you said that you are by nature an introvert before we got started with the interview you said you were by nature an introvert but that you had adapted to become extrovert because of the leader the role as being a leader how has introvert versus extrovert affected that building up of that team i had to want to um i hold the pulse i hold the pulse uh to 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 the team that i i'm supposed to lead right Mm -hmm. if i walk in and i'm quiet an extrovert, no one else is going to talk either. I need my team to feel comfortable communicating with me. So in turn, I have to communicate with them. So if something's going wrong, I know when something's different with them mm. uh, and stuff. So I uh, definitely uh, grew up, man, um, as a as a uh, introvert. But I understand in order for me to be effective as a leader, I have to be more open. Um, I have to communicate um, openly and quite honestly, I have to be more vulnerable as well. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, Tell, and- telling my story. Uh, so people know, uh, the, the things because people look at us, man, and they read our bios, uh, they look at our rank and they think we have all of our stuff together. Mm-hmm. It is far from true. Mm-hmm. We've all faced a lot of adversity, uh, coming up in the ranks. I, like I said, I wasn't a model airman growing up. 
And they need to know that. I've made mistakes as well, but I've learned from them. And I'm going to tell you the mistakes that I made because I don't want you to make the same mistakes as me. Absolutely. Uh, I think, I think, I think leaders are afraid of being, you know, of being flawed. Right. I think that for so long they were afraid, but I mean, look at how many individuals had article 15s or severe reprimands in their career and still push through, but yet they're afraid to use that to tell somebody else, listen, it's possible to make it through this. But speaking of your story and where you've been and what you've gone through, uh, why don't you give us that moment of spiritual resiliency? Like give us that moment that you went through something that was just stressful, painful, whatever the, whatever your story is, let us, let us hear what that moment was for you. No. So Nate, um, I'll start, I'll start here. Um, I kind of talk about some of the things that I didn't necessarily do right. Uh, I'm going to take you down a, a chain of events that kind of um, um, led me to where I had to uh, tap into uh, my spiritual resiliency, right? Things that I invested, you know, from an investment standpoint, you're investing things, expecting a return on investment and stuff. And I'm going to tell you why I always uh, um, practice my spiritual resiliency uh built in my spiritual bank uh per se um right and one of the things that i just i dealt with recently was um back in 2020 uh um i volunteered to deploy i i volunteered to deploy for uh six months and um prior to that deployment um i lost my auntie uh to to, to cancer uh right um and you know mission Mission have to uh, continue. Um, I went, paid my respects to my aunt, uh, deployed. Uh, during my deployment, um, I lost two people that was very important to me. Um, I lost my grandmother, um, and I lost a really good military friend of mine uh, during that deployment. Uh, but life, I, I had mission. I just stayed busy, right? And I never did deal with that 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 trauma. Uh, uh, that I had to deal with, all right? End up coming back uh, to, to, to my home station. Uh, only had three months left on station, right? Uh, where I was getting ready to PCS to Alaska. Did that PCS. Uh, come back. Um, I started back to uh, build a relationship with the family because, you know, uh, when you leave, uh, things are different when you come back. Um, and it was one of those things. My uh, youngest daughter was, we was best friends best friends, right? But mm. she got used to uh, coping without me. And that was pretty painful to come back. And the little girl that was your best friend, uh, right? Things were different. Mm. Uh, and we had to build that relationship back. Uh, I can tell you that lasted for a long time. Uh, and I got to the fall of last year, uh, right around the October time period. Um, and, uh, being in Alaska, you know, it's very dark, uh, in the winter time, um, things start to slow down a little bit and I was just able to think more. Um, and I never did mourn the death of my family members, right? Cause I just kept busy. Um, right. Um, never did, uh, mourn, uh, that the death of my friend and then I get back. And then I'm looking at the relationship between my daughter and I, and it just wasn't the same. Um, and I told you, I was one of those ones that I go to church weekly, um, right? Um, I quit going to church. I, I just quit um, because uh, depression started to set in. I lost all of these things. My relationship with my daughter is just not the same, um, right? And um, after a month, um, uh, my pastor reached out to me and he was like, Chuck, I haven't seen you. Mm. What's going on? I was like, uh, everything's great, Pastor. You know, I'm watching service online. I just don't want to be around people. Um, right. Um, around mid-November, that depression, uh, it, it was starting to get the best of me. Um, I started having medical issues going on with me, Nate, and uh, didn't know what was going on. Didn't want to check, uh, get uh, get it checked out either. Um, I just had in my head, whatever it was that was going on with me, I just wanted it to take me out. Yeah. Mm. Just take me out. 
uh, right? And um, fast forward to like the end of um, uh, November, we had a Thanksgiving blessing food drive at our church, and I was one of the, the uh, leads uh, for it. And um, I leave work, um, dude, and this is how, this is when I realized God had a plan for me. Mm. He didn't want what I was currently going through to take me out. I drove uh, Alaska, right? I drove from the base. Um, I probably drove a good five miles, dude, um, on a flat tire, on ice, oh on the gosh. highway, going upwards of 70 miles an hour. I get to a red light, and a gentleman on his side of it is like, hey, you have a flat tire. And I was like, oh, my gosh, just something else. And um, I, I get to a point where um, I change the tire out. I make it to the church and um, my associate pastor looked at me and she was like, Chuck, what's wrong? I was like, I'm just over it. I don't want to go anymore. Um, right. And at that moment, she she prayed for me and I felt a shift. Uh, because now I start to replay all of those things that 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 occurred in my life. And I drive down a highway going 70 miles an hour on a flat tire. And as she was praying, I was I was hearing God say, I am not done with you yet. Right. But it took that spiritual connectedness with my church to help bring me out um, because I could have stayed at home. Um, right. Um, I couldn't have had that relationship with my church family where somebody felt comfortable reaching out mm -hmm. uh, because even though my friends and, and, and family see me every single day, I, I can hide it. Mm -hmm. I can hide it uh, uh, going through because we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to show weakness when it comes to our families and stuff. And my family never knew what I was going through at that moment. Never did, uh, knew what I was going with, uh, uh, going through and you, work. Do you think that there's there's a sense of it's the people that you're around every single day, your family, and the changes were just so so minimal that it's it's almost like that psychological drift where where everything starts, you know, changing just ever so slowly that they didn't notice it even because you were hiding it or you were allowing them only to see portions enough to where it became so normal. Yep. Sm smaller outbursts, right? Mm -hmm. um, I shared with my team recently, um, right? They, I had someone going through something and then I kind of shared my story of what I was going through, right? And it was one of those things where um, um, a member on my team is actually going through some things real uh, right now. And um, one of my uh, leaders uh, kind of stated that I don't know if he's really going through this. And I was like, whoa, hold on. You you don't know what these folks are going through. Let me share a story with you real quick. And then I kind of walked through the story that I just shared with you, Nate. And I was like, did any of you guys know? No, but because I continue to come. Uh, coming to work and lead you guys at the best of my ability. But when I left here at the end of the day and I went and got in my bed, my mind was just racing. I was always processing. And I was hoping that uh, the next day I didn't wake up. And they never knew. Right. Um, and I and I try to t teach them. I was like, hey, you don't know what these people are going through. I need you to have grace. I need you to ask more questions. Mm -hmm. I'm right. Never assume that you know, because as soon as you think you you know something, that's when the worst will happen. Um, so uh, that's 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 part of the story that I wanted to to, to share uh, with you as well as the audience that you have here, uh, Nate. Um, and see you, Master Sergeant E8 in the military. Wow. Right. Depression set in and when life slowed down i had to cash in that spiritual bank that spiritual resiliency my spiritual leader my spiritual father for my church kind of helped me get out well and it was so important for those relationships because it's something that that is is themed throughout 
each of these, no matter if I'm talking to ag ag agnostic or I'm talking to an atheist or, or a Christian or a Muslim, it doesn't matter. They all say one thing comes down to it. Healing happens in the context of relationships. Absolutely. It, it doesn't say relationship between a Christian and a Christian or a Christian and a Muslim or an agnostic and, a, and an atheist. It just relationship creates an environment for healing. Absolutely. Because we and need to cash in on that with each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and we're invested in that every single day. So when you need to cash in, right, it's not one of those things when 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 everything to hit the fan and, and now you want to practice resiliency. No, these are things that you have to do throughout the, the year. Every day, every week, every month, right? Build it up that bank where when you need the cash in, you can pull out. And then when you get yourself to a point where you're 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 healed, uh, right now you start investing back into that thing. Mm -hmm. um, where when you need to pull out again, you can get a return on everything that you've invested into that 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 bank, whether it's your spiritual, emotional, social, physical, whatever the case may be. Uh, for me, it was spiritual that got me out because I was still working out. I was still mm -hmm. being social at work, mm -hmm. right? I'm still doing all of those things, but it didn't help me uh, get out of the situation that I was in. Because you had to adapt to your to your pillars. You know, it, one thing that that is is constantly going through is that these four pillars that we have: social, mental, uh, physical, social, physical, emotional, and spiritual. If one starts to crumble, and we don't fix it, or we don't we don't try to to stabilize it. And it goes down. I mean, the whole thing comes crashing down. Yep. It, it, it one pillar could do that. And and I was so amazed because I'm sitting here looking back at our conversation and how it started between you and I after Chief introduced me. It took uh, four notes. You 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 wrote one two. The third thing that you wrote me was I shared with Chief earlier about a dark time I had just gone through, and I'm willing to share the story on your podcast. Like, that, that is amazing. Your third line that you wrote me, and you were already saying, hey, I'm willing to share it. I'm willing to get it out there. Because you understand the power that comes with speaking it. Because it's healing for you, as well as it's healing for me to hear somebody has gone through it. Uh, an E8, I'm an E7, and the E8 went through something like that. Uh, it, somebody that's going to hear this is going to be able to go, yeah, that's me. I need to figure this something. I need to figure something out. Yeah. We try to cookie cutter it way too much. Right. And, and I encourage anybody to have a story, right? Please share it. Um, I have a mentee of mine. That stationed here with me right now. He came to my office at Wits End, doing the same dark spot. And I told him how I was feeling. And he was like, Chuck, I feel the same exact way. This is the first time that I've actually spoken. And that's, Being vulnerable. That's, that's that relationship. Yep. That's just, that's, you're right. That's being vulnerable. That's just allowing somebody to know you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. We all experience things in life. Mm. Every last one of us. And none of us are immune to adversity. We all experience things. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so definitely got to be vulnerable and, and, and share that stories because you don't know who you can help. If your story helped one person, mm -hmm. that's one, mm -hmm. that's one uh, life saved. You know, and, and it's the power of one, right? It's, it's the power of one. Yeah. Because you want to know why, what, what happens? We, 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 you help that one, that one is going to help someone else. Uh, right. And we create that ripple. Effect. Mm -hmm. We can change the world one person at a time. And you continue to invest and continue to invest. And now that one is to Compound. one is to one is to one. Is to that one. compounding effect. Yep. And it's beautiful to watch. It's beautiful to be able to watch because, but here's, here's what it takes is it takes leaders actually stepping out of what they knew as the leadership style and finding a new approach.
I tell my people, I can't tell you how to care, but I can show you. I can show you through my actions how to care. You need to care enough about your team to say, I don't care enough. You need to care enough to say, I don't care enough. You need to find somebody else. At least give somebody the, the, the ability to go to someone else to go find somebody who's willing to help them a little bit. And I know it sounds harsh, like I don't care, but you need to say, I don't care so that they can at least find somebody and reach out to somebody else. Yeah. And here, here's the thing. You don't have to be the expert at everything, Nate. You mm. just have to be a connector. Right. I spend a lot of time connecting because I'm not the smartest person, mm. but I do know somebody that, 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 that have experienced something that you have because we have these conversations where, Hey, I don't know what you're going through. Mm -hmm. I've never experienced that in my life, but I know somebody else that, that does. If you're okay with this, I will send a joint message. To this individual connecting you guys, uh, where you can kind of talk through that, uh, right? Um, I, I look at myself as being a connector. Man, you're speaking so much goodness right now. Yeah, man, life experience, man. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, um, it's one of those things I told you, Nate. Uh, as a, a, I'm a uh, introvert, um, but um, I, I do uh, believe in the Holy Spirit. Um, right. And when uh, God is in, 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 in the midst, uh, amazing things can happen. Absolutely. Uh, right. So the ultimate connector. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, brother. <laughs> hey, so final thing. So I always ask this and I always put links down in the comments. What are you reading right now? Or what is one thing that you would suggest for somebody to read? Uh, so one that I'm, I'm looking at now, um, uh, actually, uh, a mentor sent it to me, uh, is the potential principle uh, by Mark Sanborn. Uh, that's what I'm currently reading now. Uh, and it's one of those books where you go from being good to great. Um, a lot of times we, we get comfortable, uh, right. And we don't look to expand, right. Once we get into that comfort zone, um, we, 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 we like to chill there. Uh, right. And I believe, uh, uh, not only is this mentor, a spiritual, uh, mentor of mine, she's also a, a Air Force leader, um, as well. And, um, we have really, really raw conversations like, no, I don't want to do anymore. <laughs> I don't want to do anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I'm done. Uh, and, um, she was like, uh, a book of being in the mail in a week. Uh, and <laughs> this is what that I'm reading now, man, to go from uh, being good to great, uh, the uh, potential principle uh, and stuff. Um, uh, so it's a really good uh, read. I'm just now beginning it, but uh, it's, it's definitely shaping out to be a good read uh, where uh, they kind of give you some principles that you can uh, um, um, explore uh, to get to great. So the potential principle by who? Yep. Mark Sanborn. S-A-N-B-O-R-N. You know, I'm from Mississippi, so I'm a little country at times. <laughs> it's all right, man. I'm down here in the South. I've kind of gotten used to the draw, so I'm, I'm kind of yeah. liking it being around here. I'm from Oklahoma, so I don't know if I'm South, North, East, West. They, 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 just, they just tell me you're Central, and I'm like, oh, okay. Works hey, for me. Chameleon. Hey, yeah. you, you float to whatever environment you're in, brother. Adaptable absolutely hey chuck thank you so much for being here and investing in in not only the listeners but in me uh, it's always great to be able to see senior leaders in the military or in the companies that are willing to step up and step out and away from people to to invest in like-minded individuals as well as people who want to expound themselves to to really explore what is out there for them so thank you chuck so much for investing in us Hey, man, appreciate the opportunity, uh, Nate, uh, and also uh, the recommendation by Chief Vaden. Um, I told him when I came on to his podcast that, hey, you're stretching me right now. <laughs> uh, podcasts are not uh, anything uh, uh, that that I've, I've been doing or anything like that. And then he recommended uh, your podcast as we were talking um, uh, during our uncut version, right, mm. um, where we just we start to pour into each other and stuff. He was like, hey. Hey, I got this guy. 
uh, <laughs> you would be good on his show. I was like, all right, chief, uh, because it's one of those things. If 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 you push me out there, uh, right, um, I'll take a chance. Yeah. Um, uh, so thanks for taking a chance uh, with me, uh, Nate, and hopefully uh, the the audience that's listening to this, they they're able to glean something um, out of to help them move forward. Absolutely. Hey, guys, today's episode is only possible thanks to my friend and the producer of this show, G. Frazier, with 369sounddesign.com. Uh, he is the one that has the hardest job of anyone here. It's not talking. It's not coming up with concepts, but it is rather making me sound good. So I know that he puts a lot into it for that fact alone. Uh, we are blessed by the entire team here at the wartime leadership podcast see you next week 